Hi, I'm Vic Perry and welcome to our podcast. Brought to you by Living Positive Victoria, the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society and the Alfred Hospital Education and Resource Centre. And today we're going to be covering HIV and treatments. And joining me today is Jennifer Power, coordinator of the HIV Futures Survey at La Trobe University, and Jenny Hoy. And Jenny is the Director of HIV Medicine at the Department of Infectious Diseases at the Alfred Hospital and Monash University. Today we're talking about the findings of the latest future survey in regards to treatments. Now, before we go into the specifics, Jenny, would you like to give us a bit of a background to the uh, future survey? Sure. So, HIV Futures is Australia's really longest running survey of people living with HIV, a study. Uh, we began it in 1997, and that, at that time, um, highly active antiretroviral treatment had just become available in Australia. So we were really interested in tracking health and well-being of people living with HIV in this new era of treatment, I guess. So what we've done since then is repeat the survey eight times, so every two or three years since 97, and most recently in 2016 with HIV Futures 8, and we've looked at a range of issues. So we've looked at physical health, mental health, general well-being, life experiences, so relationships, um, and certainly treatment use as well over that period of time. Which is what we're talking about today. So what does yeah. Futures 8 tell us about uh, people and, and treatments and their experiences with treatments? Look, it tells us what we really expected. So we heard from just under 900 people living with HIV in Australia. 96% of those were currently taking treatment for HIV. That's, That's probably... Yeah, it's probably slightly higher because we were more likely to hear from people who are engaged in services. Just the nature of recruiting for the survey meant that. Um, people who are less engaged and or people who are newly diagnosed and maybe not commenced treatment yet were po possibly less represented in this study. Um, so it was high. Um, we also, um, we asked people when they were diagnosed and we did find that among people who were diagnosed in the last five years, just over 60% had commenced treatment within three months. So people were commencing treatment quite early, but there was 20% within that newly diagnosed group who had waited over 12 months to start treatment. So I think that's probably something that'll be interesting to watch over time, just to see if that 20% gets lower and we're seeing more and more people starting treatment early. Mm. And that's, that is interesting, and I guess we would expect to see changes. Yep. So Jenny, in your uh, clinical experience, uh, particularly with people who are newly diagnosed, what have you seen in terms of changes over, over time? Uh, so I think we're, we're seeing similar changes. The way that um, patients approach treatment is often based on experiences from friends or peers, what they read online, but also what they're told by their doctors. And the doctors, hopefully, uh, use evidence clinical evidence to base their recommendations on whether to start treatment early or not. And in fact, it was in 2015, the year before this most recent uh, future survey, that the results of a landmark clinical trial that involved over 4,000 people worldwide were released. And, and the results showed that there was clinical benefit to early treatment. And since that time, more and more data has become available from um, the START study, showing that there's better quality of life from starting treatment early. There's more and more data saying there's benefit and not risk from starting treatment. So doctors changed their attitudes um, with this medical evidence and started offering treatment around the time of diagnosis. And more people are taking it up. And, rather than to food. And in, in addition to that, uh, in that, I guess, context, um, also, uh, I know from my experience in talking to people in a community setting, uh, there's not only the, the advice that they're getting from the GP, which is changing it and heading towards more to start treatment early, but as you mentioned before about peers, mm -hmm. uh, that's incredibly important now and how influential they can be where, uh, and we've mentioned this in another podcast where we talked about the very fact that today there's a, a much 
bigger chance for a person who's diagnosed to already know someone else who's diagnosed and, and in particular someone on treatment and to see the experiences of other people on treatments and how well people are doing today gives uh, people a lot more confidence to, to, to decide to go on treatment straight away as well. Yes. Uh, so if their partner or a friend is already doing well on treatments, then they'll think themselves that, oh, okay, it's, I can see it first hand that it's not that bad. Um, yes. yeah. And that's certainly happening a lot today. And in terms of transmission as well, that's uh, another area where uh, I guess people are newly diagnosed that are getting more confidence and, and, and almost enthusiasm. Uh, and I see people thinking, yeah, I want to go on treatment straight away because I want to minimise my chance of passing on HIV. Yeah. I, I know the science, I've read all the stuff about you know minimising the risk by being undetectable uh, and undetectable being that while you still have HIV but you're successfully suppressing the virus, uh, can almost zero risk uh, can, can happen when uh, 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 when one has a, a suppressed virus, and we say almost. And, and I guess from your scientific perspective, why do we say almost uh, zero? Uh, I think that, that it's a it's a concept that's very difficult to actually explain to people who don't have a maths or a biostatistical background, but because the numbers of people that uh, were involved in the trials looking at transmission in um, individuals that are virologically suppressed, undetectable viral loads, there's still that element of uncertainty. You would need thousands and thousands of people to say definitively there is absolutely no risk. So we have this uh, concept of a 95% chance, and that is very low, very, very low, but it's still there, which is why we can't say we definitely can't. Yeah. What we've seen in futures, in recent, I think, between futures 7, which was done in about 2012, 2013, and futures 8, which was done in 2015, 2016, is evidence, I think, or some indication that that um, new evidence around the very, very almost zero risk of yes. transmission is starting to filter through. So we'd always ask this question about the extent to which people were concerned about transmitting HIV to sexual partners and we found that had gone up consistently since since 97 and the first time it started to go down was in Futures 8 and that corresponds really well to when um, a very or several major studies released their findings showing that transmission was so low and, and I think people are starting to feel more confident yeah, about that. And, and PrEP which has just been uh, introduced I guess fairly recently as well in terms of a factor in, 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 in transmission rates uh, and, and this will probably uh, come out in the next futures. I think so. In the next yeah. couple of futures where there'll be even more confidence uh, even though futures are about positive people um, but they uh, you know, they're, they're knowing that their negative friends or people that they know uh, and the confidence that they see uh, in the general community about transmission and the factors that, that PrEP uh, uh, is making a, an even bigger change. Um, I think the psychological benefits of PrEP for positive people is something that we'll start to see absolutely over the next few years. So in terms of people who have been on treatments for a long time and, and uh, I guess that as we do uh, become more and more enthusiastic about getting people on treatment straight away, so we've got large numbers of people on treatments for, for many years, uh, how about fatigue, is that something, is that an issue that uh, is uh, impacting on how people are taking treatments and, and is it to the point where people are stopping treatments. Uh, I, I don't think it is. So I, 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 for myself personally, you know, I, I think of fatigue. I think, yeah, I'm, I'm fatigued from taking treatments every day, but it doesn't stop me from doing it. I still do it. Uh, but I can understand the concept that uh, it is some kind of, uh, I guess what word might be, not indifference, but uh, you get tired of uh, just taking pill, pills every single day. Um, what do you see in your, in your So I, I, I see a couple of things. I, th I see people who are starting treatment in recent times with the newer medications, one pill once a day. It's like taking a pill for high blood pressure or high cholesterol. You have to take those 
you have to take this pill for um, HIV. So, and, the, and also the most recent medications have, have less side effects than the old medications. So they're easier to take and they're easier to remember. And I don't see fatigue entering into people's minds at this point. It's actually the, the people that I've been looking after for 20 to 30 years that are on the older, have been on the older regimens. We're looking and trying to simplify the regimens, trying to cut down the number of pills being a bit more confident in being able to do that um, and individuals are very happy with less pills because as we age and we do get the comorbidities of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, there are numerous medications that need to be taken for those conditions and when you add those medications onto a number of medications for HIV, that's when people start to say, oh, I'm really sick of this, can't we simplify things? When you do simplify, you're much happier. We, we did find in HIV futures that people aged over 50 were more likely to report experiencing side effects from their HIV treatment, but that was actually um, irrespective of how long they'd been on treatment. So even people aged over 50 who'd been diagnosed in the last five years, the numbers were small, to be, to be fair, but even among that little group, they were still more likely to ex report experiencing some side effects than younger, newly diagnosed people. And, and perhaps that's because as we age, we do get aches and pains yeah. with osteoarthritis, we do get other symptoms, shortness of breath, if you're a smoker or asthma, etc and we tend to lump them all into this is caused by HIV or this is caused by the treatments when in fact they're not, they're caused by the other conditions that we're experiencing. Um, and I think it, it's, it's a problem when we do um, start looking at every symptom, every abnormal blood test is due to the HIV medication when that's not the case. Mm. So, but it's hard to know what's what when you... As an individual, you can't know. Mm. You know you're reliant on the, the advice of your, of your doctors and, and nurses that, that are overseeing your healthcare to explain to you that this is due to HIV, this is due to the meds, we'll change the meds, this is due to something else. And in terms of the, the I guess if we wanted to convince people out there whether it's worth going on treatment or not, or, or what the benefits are. In terms of the research, it, it's been pretty consistent lately, hasn't it? The, the, the long -term so the long-term benefits are there. Um, there's a reduction in uh, the comorbidities that uh, we measure. For example, there's a reduction in heart attacks, reduction in cancers related to immunodeficiency, low levels of immune function. In the long term, they're all much better on treatment. And we're also seeing many more studies now suggesting almost normal life expectancy as the person standing next to you without HIV. Um, so that's an exciting um, gain that we've seen with the newer treatments. So do you find people who are newly diagnosed, one, do they have concerns about commencing treatment, do you find? And do you, do you get a sense of what the things are people worry about? So that, I guess I, I might see a different group of people um, working in a hospital clinic or on the wards. I see people who perhaps have more advanced immunodeficiency. It's very easy to um, suggest that treatment is really good at this point. Um, for those that have normal CD4 cell counts that come to a hospital clinic, they often do not know anyone with HIV. Often much more isolated, they don't go to the high caseload genetic practices. Um, they're more reliant on what advice I can bring and what um, information I bring to the table. Um, and so then it's all about how you um, deliver the, the um, information around the benefits of antiretrovirals. Because I believe in it, um, you know, I would 
would suggest that it's a good thing to do. And those individuals usually, I do have a couple of people who are less confident about starting treatment who continue to question and we go over the data each time they come in as we measure their CD4 cells. Um, but in general, most people are happy to start treatment. Um, you know, they think, I've got a condition, you've got treatment, why aren't I on it? Yeah, doing something about it. Yes, exactly. And it's interesting, uh, I, I remember, um, uh, I think it was Dr. Mark Chung who said uh, uh, at a conference that it was interesting that uh, HIV was one of those things that, uh, uh, and different to every other bacteria or virus that we get, that as soon as we get something, we treat it. Yet HIV has been one of those things that we had waited and waited and waited for obvious reasons, but yes. uh, it, was, it was a wait and see kind of thing. Well, we can go back as far as just AZT monotherapy. If you remember, there was the Concord study mm -hmm. which randomised people with over 500 CD4 cells to AZT monotherapy. And because AZT was not a good drug, it didn't work. The study showed you need to wait. Um, and so until we have access or had access to good, potent drugs with minimal side effects, it's been so much easier. Yeah. yeah, and really that's, I mean, if we look at data from the futures, you definitely saw um, a decrease in the early 2000s in terms of people, the number of people on treatment and then it's just gone consistently up since yeah. then. So even post 97, it yeah. didn't yeah. seem like it really got easy until 2004-ish. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well that's when different, the, the newer classes, yeah. the integrated inhibitors, inhibitors. Yeah. they made a, a much bigger difference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well that's uh, another wrap for another vodcast. Uh, thanks for uh, listening. Um, I'm Vic Perry and thanks uh, Jen and thanks, thanks Jenny. And make sure you keep an eye out for our other vodcasts on uh, a whole range of other topics. I'm Vic Perry, thanks for watching. <laughs>